as you can see, if I think that if Churchill were alive today, he would be an other Twitter, Twitter follower. He would have millions of followers. He would be an avid Instagrammer and doubtlessly the man would take a few selfies. Um, even though we know that this image has been photoshopped and handy for us, it, the original is there, which is also on our guidebooks today, um, it's placing Churchill in a contemporary pose using what is now commonplace technology and social media. And it reveals how relevant Churchill remains today. My contribution to today's proceedings is to enhance your knowledge of Churchill uh, and most particularly to talk about the historical trends within Churchill studies. But before I do, I'd like to use a very recent example, which when I heard about it and read about it, I cheered a little, um, because it shows how divisive Churchill remains. Five days ago, the American astronaut Scott Kelly inadvertently landed himself in hot water when he shared through Twitter what he thought was an inspirational quote. As you can see, Kelly wrote, one of the greatest leaders of modern times, Sir Winston Churchill said, in victory, and I can never say this word properly, magnanimity. I guess those days are over. What Kelly was actually referring to was the way in which American politics has recently become so divisive itself. And what he was calling for was he was urging Americans not to allow this to continue. What Kelly probably didn't expect was the barrage of tweets from some of his own followers who severely rebuked him for quoting Churchill who, some wrote, was not the greatest leader of modern times and was nothing but a racist imperialist who had personally been responsible for the death of, and I quote, three million Indians during the Bengal famine of 42 to 43. Now, when Kelly tried to apologize for the tweet, he offered to educate himself on what he described as Churchill's atrocities and racist views. And Kelly could not have envisaged this either. He was then attacked by a legion of Churchill fans for discrediting the politician's record. You can see now why the jar of Marmite shares the space, if you'll forgive the pun, uh, with Kelly the astronaut on the slide. Churchill, almost half a century, well, over half a century since she died, is still the Marmite of history studies. Um, love him or loathe him, he is nonetheless discussed and as teachers I hope that you engage your students within debate and Churchill as I've heard today is one of the most easily ones to get them engaged in. Um, thing is Churchill is still as divisive <coughs> and opinion on him is still as extreme and more often than not just as erroneous as it was throughout his early career. Perhaps this is one reason why exam boards seem to like him so much. Looking at the top, working our way down, Edexcel, GCSE level, including modern world history, 20th century, Churchill is a big part of. Germany, Churchill is a big part of, part of, and as we saw in the talks earlier, the Cold War too. Cambridge International, their GCSE, 19th century, and then also 20th century. Churchill has to be a part of those too. AQA, British Empire, International Relations, Wars and Welfare, and the Cold War. Once again, Churchill can be placed forefront. Regarding OCR, I know that there is the depth study, I can't remember what the code is, but England in the new century, political issues, social issues, Britain at war and Britain 1951, Churchill once again is a figure of study. Social issues, Britain at war, British politics, domestic politics, and if you have a look, 29 to 39, that covers his wilderness years. He was still actually quite active. He said that he was alone in the wilderness. He, in a way, he was compared to his previous career, but he still had very highly placed friends. Finally, looking at the OCR boards for A-levels, the non-British study, once again, and I know I'm a Churchill obsessive, but I could cram Churchill into both of those very, very happily. So you can see why he is included in so much. The thing is, um, it's to underpin one of the reasons why I agreed to do this this year and last year, one of the reasons why I really enjoy it, 
it so that you can I can underpin your understanding of how historical trends within church or studies have mirrored the ebb and flow. So, and perhaps, and it's already happened to a friend of mine, um, our perceptions alter the past. And possibly one day in 10 years, 20 years time, a student of yours will come back to you and say, you were wrong about this. This is now how we interpret it. It's happened to a friend of mine and it's perfect because it shows how what I say this afternoon it goes against the grain for some historians, but I know that in the future, some historians will come back to me. So, first of the next three slides illustrates the way in church which Churchill studies have gone through a transformation. Unveiled by his wife, Lady Clementine, in 1973, this is a headshot of the sculpture created by Ivor Roberts Jones. The unveiling was attended by the serving Prime Minister Ted Heath, four former British Prime Ministers and Queen Elizabeth II, who rather unusually for this type of occasion gave a speech. Eight years after he had died, Churchill's legacy still commanded respect and his image of the determined wartime bulldog who wouldn't cower or roll over was, if not exactly set in stone, certainly immortalised in bronze. This is not to say that contemporaries of his didn't challenge him. They did. But the historiography of the post-war era tended to laud and tended to venerate. If it appeared unseemly to challenge his wartime leadership, uh, then to revisit episodes where he suffered disaster or defeat was just not considered cricket. Following on, during the May Day riots of 2000, James Matthews, a former soldier who'd served in Bosnia, climbed on top of the statue and sprayed it with red paint, as you can see. As, and he topped him off with a turf Mohican. CCTV images of Matthews made the news headlines, and within 24 hours, Matthews handed himself into the police. He explained that whilst as a soldier, he condemned the vandalism of the Whitehall Cenotaph, he said that defacing Churchill was a different matter. And I quote, the May Day celebrations were in the spirit of free expression against capitalism. Churchill was an exponent of capitalism and of imperialism and anti-Semitism. A Tory reactionary vehemently opposed to the emancipation of women and to independence in India. The media machine made this paunchy little man much larger than life. A colossal, towering figure of great statue and bearing with trademark cigar, bowler hat and V-sign. The reality was often an irrational, sometimes vainglorious leader whose impetuosity, egotism and bigotry on occasion cost lives unnecessary and caused much suffering that was needless and unjustified. Understandably, Matthew's actions drew widespread condemnation from the general public. He was sentenced to 30 days imprisonment in order to pay a £250 fine. To me, Matthew's summation of Churchill contained errors of fact and judgment. But the vitriol which Matthews aimed at Churchill mirrored the iconoclastic movement of historians within Churchill studies. Skepticism and challenging the traditional status quo, almost mythical status of Churchill, had now become mainstream. Less than a decade after Matthews' actions uh, had made the headlines, the artist Marcus Harvey, the contemporary of Tracy Emin and Damien Hirst, reimagined Matthews's provocative image. It was part of his White Riot exhibition, a reference to the 1977 debut single by the punk band The Clash. Harvey sculpted his Bron Churchill bust with a mohawk. Instead of the sculpture, which he named the Lord, the Lord High Admiral, being a more permanent form of Matthews' vandalism, Harvey actually transformed the bloodied church of 2000 into a new iconic image. He said, and I quote, Rather than serving to satirise Churchill, the Mohican gives ownership to that generation, the punk generation, and underlines Churchill's own reputation as someone who stood aside from the establishment, end quote. Harvey's work represented not just the complexities of 21st century British cultural and historical identity, but Harvey looked back to history to claim ownership of what had gone on before or at least to foster a better understanding of the contemporary situation. 
So each image of Churchill illustrates an aspect of Churchill studies, from the hagiographical, which neither challenged nor changed Churchill's legacy, to the sceptical, where challenge led to transition, and then finally the revisionist, where a detached viewpoint enables a more balanced and nuanced context to be established, which in turn then transforms history once more. As time is of the essence, I've only chosen a handful of topics which are to do with the OCR board, so I apologise to those who don't do OCR. If my, my email is on at the end, if you need further information from me, just get in touch afterwards. So, our first topic today is why Churchill was out of office between 29 and 39. One resource which I've always enjoyed are political and satirical cartoons. Following the disastrous Dardanelle campaigns, we can see that it was thought that Churchill's political career was about to sail into the distance, along with any chance of a wartime cabinet post. Yet the cartoon wasn't totally derogatory, as it made a point of showing Churchill's services in the trenches. If you can see, it's just that service in France. But the Dardanelles was only one reason why Churchill was supposedly in the wilderness. Crossing the floor of the Commons from the Conservative to the Liberal benches in 1904, his genuine belief in liberal policies and social justice, his reputation for being something of a maverick when it came to sending memos to his senior colleagues on issues which he was not directly involved in, his quick movement up the Liberal ranks and then crossing the floor back across the Commons from the Liberal back to the Conservative benches had earned him little respect something which he himself picked up on when he said that anyone can rat, but it takes a certain amount of ingenuity to re-rat. He became estranged from the Conservative leadership over the issues of protective tariffs and home rule for India. He further distanced himself from the party by his friendships with press barons, financiers and people whose characters were then seen as dubious. When Ramsay MacDonald, for, MacDonald sorry, formed the national government in 31, Churchill was not invited to join. William Manchester covered this period of wilderness in his biography of Churchill, but it remains, to me, rather superficial and, in my opinion, unchallenging. I would rather recommend Robert Rhodes James's Churchill, A Study in Failure. Rhodes James remarked that if Churchill had died at any time during his wilderness period, his life would have become nothing more than an interesting footnote to history. Looking at Churchill's writing career, and don't forget that he was actually the highest paid journalist and war correspondent of the era, you can see that his publication record increased exponentially during this period of wilderness. After all, it was his journalistic commentaries and editori editorial pieces which kept him in the public eye. Especially he was trying to garner support for whatever policy he was pursuing at the time. These pieces of penmanship are still full of remarkable skill. Fluid prose, convincing arguments. I think Natalie used the phrase earlier today of purple prose. I love purple prose. It Just pick up any book of Churchill's, read a paragraph. You are still captivated by the passion this man had. One example though, a further one, was his attitude to the abdication crisis. That also kept him isolated. Churchill was a true monarchist, and his relationship with Edward VIII went back to 1919. But it was Churchill's call for time to be made freely available for Parliament and the Crown to come to an agreement over whether abdication was, if not necessary, but possible, which further alienated Churchill. One reason as to why the whole history of the abdication crisis has yet to be fully written is because there are 11 boxes of papers from Edward VIII's lawyer and advisor, Sir Walter Monckton, which you can see just at the bottom, which have yet to be released. These boxes were reviewed in 2000 and it was decided that one box was to remain sealed until 2037. I hope I live that long. This one box is thought to contain the extent of the Queen Mother's role in the crisis and the way in which the American divorcee, Wallace Simpson, was pilloried by the older members of the royal family. The Queen Mother never publicly spoke about the crisis and when our own Prince Edward was researching and producing his television biography, Edward on Edward, she was not interviewed. This, to me, is history at its finest, when a researcher is akin to a detective. 
and in the case of the abdication crisis and the way in which Edward was supposedly on friendly terms with a handful of the Nazi elite, we may never get to see the whole picture. Churchill's view on empire, what it was and what it stood for, is one of the most complex facets of Churchill's life. I would recommend Richard Toy's Churchill's Empire and also Hero of the Empire by Candice Millard as she argues that 1899 was a pivotal year for Churchill and his developing notion of empire. 1899 and the Handling Collection, there's a medal dating back to his mother, I think, and the ship and the American fund, Kate. Perfect timing. That helps illustrate a point I've just made. Um, but was really Churchill the staunch imperialist, which James Matthews clearly believed him to be? I would suggest not. Instead, Churchill, particularly after 1945, knew that the empire was crumbling. He knew that to hold on to Burma, for example, after the Second World War, made no financial or political sense. As the Second World War ended and the world went from a hot war into a cold one, the old concept of Iowa was becoming obsolete. Instead, two new economic and political empires, the USA and Stalin's Russia, came to the fore. As Churchill matured, so too did his opinions. He was a pragmatist and a realist regarding the British Empire. He waved his colonial hat during his earlier part of his earlier career when it suited him. And the pre-war image of him as a staunch Victorian imperialist was one which he used to his full advantage. On the post-war British Empire, Churchill, being leader of the opposition, could do little to halt the inevitable crumble and march towards its destruction and he acknowledged that Attlee and his Labour government had very little choice. I would, however, add a caveat to that, and the caveat is India. India became Churchill's obsession, and from when he was stationed in Bangalore in 1896 as a subaltern in the Queen's Fourth Hussars until the horrors of partition occurred in 1947. India infused Churchill with such passion that in 1931, in protest against Baldwin's support of Irwin's failure to, and I quote, assert the majesty of Britain on those Indians who drink tea with treason, Churchill resigned from the shadow cabinet. Few historians have dared to write about Churchill in India. Of those who have, it's Salvapur Gopal, Gopal, Raymond Callaghan and Richard Toy, and myself. Um, uh, and all of those those three gentlemen who've written about, the three historians who've written about Church in India, they've achieved something which is impossible within Churchill studies, which is they have arrived at a balanced and nuanced narrative. As Steve Kelly, the astronaut, found out a few days ago, many simply called Churchill a racist, whose Victorian imperial hypocrisy enabled him to see India as the jewel in the empire's crown, and a jewel which would never self-govern like any of the dominions. It's on divisive and sensitive issues, such as Churchill in India, that some historians turn to the dark side. One example is Madashri Mukherjee's book, Churchill's Secret War. Mukherjee claims that Churchill was both cognizant and uncaring towards those starving during the famine of 42 and 43. In fact, it went into 44 too, and that he purposely did nothing. She concludes that Churchill was therefore to blame for the million Indians who died from the famine. Now, defamation is not always a bad thing for any historian, especially when it creates debate. No matter how hot that debate may be, when analysis of context is applied, a revised, more inclusive historical narrative can be formed. No, now, no historical narrative is definitive, but we can at least try to make it balanced. Many of the charges levelled against Churchill are plain wrong. As Andrew Roberts shows in his new single volume biography, which I would say is also recommended reading for all of you, Churchill, it's called Churchill Walking with Destiny. He claims that the Bengal famine was caused by cyclones and regional mismanagement. As, but also, it's the Japanese of invasion of Burma who were actually one of the biggest exporters of rice to India. Indeed, on October the 7th, 1943, Churchill declared in Cabinet that one of Sir Archibald Wavell's priorities as the, newly in, as the newly incumbent Viceroy of India must be to ensure that, and I quote, famine and flood difficulties are dealt with, a demand he continued to make in his personal contacts with Wavell throughout until 45. Churchill as wartime... Oh, there you go, sorry about that. Perfect. You see, once again, cartoons, they deliver the message home. Uh, 
1931, when Church was talking about drinking tea with treason, that's obviously a reference to the Round Table conferences, and Gandhi walking down the steps of, think of Whitehall wearing his loincloth. Once again, you have Churchill being seen as the bulldog, the cigar, bless him, the little hat, and saltpeter. Saltpeter was relevant because of the salt marches, the salt taxes in India, but they turn it around wonderfully, I think, by, yes, David Lowe, create saltpeter. Churchill was explosive on India. So, Churchill is wartime prime minister and why he became prime minister in 1940. It's one of the most researched areas on Churchill studies. I've been lucky enough to spend a fair amount of time here in the archives, but that still doesn't stop me from being completely overwhelmed by the amount of history, by the shelves and shelves and shelves of publications on this one topic. Was he really the only man, I think is a question you should ask yourself, who could lead Britain and her empire against the Nazis? No. There was the Holy Fox, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Halifax, whose strength over Churchill was that, although he was not well liked, he was certainly well respected. Before Churchill became Prime Minister, his critics, his critics were growing in strength and number. He was even by some regarded as a danger to the very future of Britain, let alone her empire. Churchill may have been invited back to the Admiralty as First Lord in September 39, but there were some in Cabinet and out who claimed that this was a mistake due to his impetuousness and his past record at the Admiralty making digs about the failed Gallipoli campaign of 15 to 16. Churchill's own account of how he became the King's First Minister in 1940 started to be composed six years after the end of the war. Um, sorry, six years after he became Prime Minister, is also misleading. It describes the events of 9th of May as taking place the following day, and the description of Chamberlain attempting to persuade him to agree tacitly to Halifax's appointment as Prime Minister doesn't measure up when compared against Halifax's recollection, who had expressed his reluctance to do so to Chamberlain at a meeting between the two men on the morning of the 9th. Perhaps Churchill failed to check his facts, as historians were all sometimes too busy thinking of deadlines, so we're all guilty of that. Um, or, as the late Sir Martin Gilbert would say whenever he read the word perhaps with regard to Churchill, perhaps not. In this instance, Churchill, I would say, would be the hagiographical type of historian. Once again, I would suggest Robert Blake's a single chapter, oh sorry, not Robert, not Robert Jones, um, I would suggest Robert Blake's single chapter on how Churchill became Prime Minister within the edited collection Blake and Louis, Churchill and New Assessment. I would also recommend Ashley Jackson's swift treatment of the episode within his book and also John Lukash's Five Days in May. Now this slide sits perfectly in this selection because it illustrates the extent to which Churchill's narrative of the Second World War entered the collective consciousness so quickly after the war and was so influential that subsequent histories followed the avenues which he laid down. In the late 1960s, the Cambridge historian John Harold Plum astutely wrote that the history of the war, its narrative and its structure has been organised in a deliberate way by Churchill. Plum observed that the phases of the war, which Churchill had constructed in order to aid the flow of his memoirs, were already deeply influencing subsequent historians, who found themselves moving down the same very broad avenues, which Churchill had managed to drive through the complexity and confusion of war. The conclusion that Plum drew from Churchill's narrative was that Churchill the historian lies at the very heart of all historiography of the Second World War and will always remain there. Almost half a century after Plum's critique, it's as pertinent today as it was then. How many times have you heard the phrase, Britain was alone? I suggest that this is another instance of Churchill's historical narrative not being entirely accurate. If you have the time and inclination, read David Edgerton's book, Britain's War Machine. Whilst not strictly within the remit of Churchill's studies, Edgerton still convincingly dispels the alone myth. Churchill's inclusive wartime cabinet um, made plans for post-war reconstruction, which were primarily liberal in nature, but he did make a caveat. Nothing would or could be implemented until after the war was over. The Beveridge Report received instant fame and approval upon a publication in 1942, 
and the political agenda was transformed. Until the end of the war, British domestic politics were dominated by questions of social reform. Constrained by the need to maintain the unity of the wartime coalition, Labour politicians and sympathisers outside of the government campaigned vociferously for the adoption of the Beveridge Report during wartime. This was in opposition to the Conservatives, who were accused, with some justice, of delaying and obstructing it. In his early years as a politician, Churchill had been a liberal and a social reformer. He'd worked with a very young Beveridge in introducing labour exchanges, and the Beveridge report itself could be construed as an extension of reforms that Churchill himself had introduced between 1908 and 1911. The Beveridge report therefore presented the Prime Minister with a golden opportunity to reinvent himself as the leader of a party seriously concerned with social and domestic questions. But understandably absorbed in the conduct of war, Churchill resented domestic distractions, especially if they were likely to cause dis dispute within his very coalition. Besides, his radical days were far behind him, and he spoke of Beveridge in private as, and I quote, a windbag and a dreamer. However, Churchill's tacit approval of these, message, these measures did little to sway the public vote in 1945, July. His image as a warlord, whilst necessary in 1940, went against him. Stalin had assured Churchill at the Potsdam Conference that he'd be returned as a peacetime prime minister. Truman, the American president, also believed that Churchill would be the figurehead to, take Britain, to lead Britain towards post-war reconstruction. It came as a great surprise to everybody, including Churchill, when he was defeated at the polls. Attlee, who had accompanied Churchill to Potsdam, became the man to lead Britain towards the end of the war and her weakening empire. Some historians, such as John, Char John Charmley, write that Churchill had presided over, over a weakening of the empire during the war and that his own decline was inexorably linked to that of the empire in 45. This type of narrative, known as the decline narrative or the splendid anachronism narrative, reflected on how Churchill was an old man who was, in the words of Roy Jenkins, quote, gloriously unfit for office from 45 onwards. Churchill, I dare say, would have balked at such a statement. If you remember one of the talks earlier, it was Catherine's talk where the Sutherland portrait, the one which was burnt and destroyed, that to me symbolised the fact that yes, Churchill was 80, yes, none of us are going to like how we look at 80. However, he was still very vital. I know that he had the strokes during his time when he was Prime Minister during the peacetime, 51 to 55, but that didn't stop him achieving things. We are too easily swayed by, well, he was old, he shouldn't have been in power, Eden should have taken over. That negates over 50 years of experience the longest serving politician of his time. I think we should value his second premiership as much as we value his first. Once again, the way in which um, Churchill's intellect and his ability to change and transform himself to whatever event or episode was going on at the time, second to none. Um, one thing which you should look at if you're going to look at this in depth with your student is his so-called Gestapo speech of 45, one of the, part of the election, electioneering campaign. Look at Richard Toy's examination of his speeches. It's very, very eye-opening because he makes no exception. Churchill made no exception to himself or to rules on his campaign trail. So once again, I would recommend Richard Toy's work. This is possibly my favourite cartoon from David Lowe. The two Churchills depicted a disgruntled Churchill, unsatisfied and feeling unappreciated as he headed back to his party as the leader of the opposition, especially as the Churchill who had been described as the leader of humanity could rest on his laurels. Churchill was certainly never a man to rest on his laurels or anyone else's. His wife Clementine described his electoral defeat in July 45 as a blessing in disguise. And once he quickly adjusted to the new role, he commenced writing his historical narrative of the Second World War. His six volume history of the Second World War was a bestseller. It was syndicated worldwide. His version of events was in the public sphere before any other official history. Although we can't class his six volume Second World War as an official history, 
the fact that it came out before anything else ensures that it's seeped into the consciousness. Uh, so syndicated worldwide legendary status. This narrative, along with his international standing and his post-war speeches, especially the Fulton and Zurich speeches, ensured that his presence on the international stage remained as vital as it had been during the war. Uh, David Reynolds analysed Churchill's narrative in 2004 and is, in my opinion, the definitive account. Churchill wielded his sword-like pen with precision, and while I would advocate that his memoirs of the Second World War reveal more about his own plans for his future than they do about the ins and outs of the war's progress, um, they're still so influential and they are so fantastic to pick up and read. It's full of daring dudes, boys' own adventures, the passion is there and if you're not swept away by the purple prose, it's a bit sad really. So. Churchill's attitude to empire. And Europe, after 1945, was flexible, pragmatic, and formed from a realistic attitude towards the rapidly changing world situation. It was once again India which proved the sticking point. This is a glorious example of which I found four from Special Archives at Exeter University and also from the Imperial War Museum in London. And they were Japanese anti- British Empire and Churchill featured in all four of them and anti-Churchill propaganda. They were dropped over northern India during 1943 towards 45. Um, and they show that it's how Churchill was depicted. Indian self-government was no longer a pipe dream in 1945 and the appointment of Mountbatten, who would be the last viceroy, saw the inevitable become a quick reality. When Churchill met Mountbatten at a garden party, after the transfer of power was complete, I think it was in uh, mid-1948, uh, yeah, August 48, um, in what some contemporary historians have called a shameful flight, Churchill had one thing to say to Mountbatten, and I quote, What you did in India, Dickie, felt like a riding crop across my face. Churchill, so it seemed, was still obsessed by India. So I'm sorry to have to swear at you, but we all know about Brexit. Uh, it caused a headache for some historians, especially when Winston's face was plastered on advertising boards with slogans such as Churchill would vote leave rather than remain or Churchill would vote remain rather than leave. This is what's claimed Churchill said in Parliament in 1953 during his second term in office as Prime Minister. We have our own dream and our own task. We are with Europe, but not of it. We are linked, but not combined. We are interested and associated, but not absorbed. If Britain must choose between Europe and the open sea, she must always choose the open sea. The problem with this quote is that it's two completely different quotes said by Churchill at different times and in different contexts. Uh, especially as what he said was often said when we're all the same, we use our families and our friends as springboards. Churchill was no different. Clementine, his wife, was the most had the most amazing calming effect on him. She knew that when he was irate, when he was passionate about something, she couldn't stand to him face to face. She would write him a letter. It was one way for him to step back and read a very sensible opinion on what he was about to do, which possibly he shouldn't. So, uh, Churchill's speeches can be taken out of context. It's very akin to fake news. You always have to double check. I've been lucky enough to study Churchill for almost a decade. I still double check every quote I come across. Richard Langworth is very good for that. Um, he's online. He's also, he used to be the editor of the Finest Hour Journal, I believe. Um, he is available online and he is an incredibly decent man to actually get in touch with. So, 19, 19th of September 1946, speaking at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, Churchill proposed the creation of a kind of United States of Europe, a European group which would give a sense of enlarged patriotism and common citizenship to the distracted peoples of this mighty continent. Churchill put his enormous personal prestige behind the cause of European unity. His campaign was by no means without controversy. 
uh, especially at home. Atlas Labour government did not favour his approach. Neither did certain elements of the Conservative Party, which, of course, he was leader. Over the coming years, it became evident that he didn't expect Britain to have full membership in a future European political union, although he said he anticipated a close association. Britain was to be with or of, but not in Europe. Churchill spelled, seldom spoke explicitly on this point. However, keeping all, all of his options open and not wishing to alienate unduly pro-unity opinion in Europe. For instance, he told the House of Commons in 1950 that, quote, I cannot conceive that Britain would be an ordinary member of a federal union limited to Europe in any period which can be present foreseen. He prefaced that remark, however, with the observation that the matter, it's not got to be decided today. In 1961, towards the end of his life, when a Conservative government sought to apply for membership in what was then the European Economic Community, he expressed his support, but in a qualified, almost ambiguous fashion. Churchill envisaged, envisaged that there would be three interrelated pillars, or majestic circles as he called them, around which the security of free peoples could be organised. Britain would play a critical, although distinct, role in each and was the only member of all three. It's the perfect Venn diagram. If you can just imagine Churchill in the middle, that's where he thought he'd be. First, there was the British Commonwealth and Empire, the traditional hub of Britain's economy and focus of its largest civilization, civilization purpose within the world. It would serve as a bulwark against and as an alternative to the radicalism already sweeping that would come to be called the third world and provide strategic locations of great value. Second, there would be a close association of the English-speaking peoples of which an Anglo-American alliance would be the core. Through this, America's power and vitality could be brought fully to bear on the problems facing the world, including those in Europe. This had been a major theme of the Fulton Address. Finally, the late Sir Martin Gilbert, who took over after the death of Randolph Churchill, Winston's son, took over the Herculean task of writing and producing the most detailed biography of Churchill to date, was frequently asked the question, why study Churchill? What relevance does he have to today's world? Aside from the fact that Churchill would doubtlessly be the most adept member of the Twitterati, in fact, I actually hope he'd run rings around the likes of Piers Morgan, Katie Hopkins, oh yes, and possibly even Boris Johnson. Um, aside from this, Sir Martin would actually say, and he wrote in the early 1990s, and I quote, in every sphere of human endeavour, Churchill foresaw the dangers and potential for evil. Many of those dangers are our dangers today. He also pointed the way forward to our solutions for tomorrow. That is one reason why his life is worthy of attention. For me, it's too easy, as well as inaccurate, to portray Churchill as a figure of the past, an anachronism or a grotesque. It negates the relevance that he and his legacy still continue to have and the potential solutions to our contemporary crises. Thank you very much. Thank you.